Hi everyone, Stephen Delbos here, the Poet Laureate of Plymouth, Massachusetts. I hope you're doing well and staying happy and healthy and uh, inspired in these strange times. And I'm thrilled to get the chance to share a few poems with you today. The first is the title poem from my chapbook published in 2016 by Cape Cod Poetry Review. It's called In Memory of Fire. And this poem is an elegy, and it's about the power of memory to hold on to past experiences and to keep them relevant and meaningful to us even after the people we shared them with are gone. In Memory of Fire. Until our flesh gives birth to bones, when the bridges of our fingers fall to earth, until our eyes ignite in memory of fire, flash bulbed as the dead sockets of blind men, when this prophecy is elegy, we won't remember that May evening in Morton Park when the flickering lanterns of lightning paraphrased our faces, but until the beds in which we slept are cinders and those cinders ash and ash a vacant story for the wind until that hometown where I reigned the wild carriage of your tears becomes a tenement of ice the borrowed letters of our names a scattered flock of startled crows the days we shared are indestructible The next poem I'd like to share with you is called Plymouth Cordage. It's a poem I wrote for the Plymouth Poet Laureateship, and it's using the metaphor of Plymouth Cordage and Cordage Park, the Plymouth Cordage Company, the rope-making factory that was the economic heart of the town from the 19th century until the 1970s. Um, it's using this as a metaphor to talk about storytelling and to talk about history and to talk about uh, my experience with Plymouth growing up there and the stories that I've learned in my research, the stories that I know uh, of fellow Plymouthians. And it's thinking about um, this metaphor of rope and the role of poetry in, in, in capturing and retelling and sharing the stories that make up our identity, that make up our history, that make up who we are. It mentions heart rope, which was a specific product of the Plymouth Cordage Company, which was a rope that had a lubricated core, which made it very flexible uh, and very strong. And this rope and Plymouth Cordage in general was famous around the world. And to me, it's such a compelling metaphor to have these raw materials coming in on ships from around the world and they're woven together into this rope that's then shipped off around the world and used um, in sh on ships around the world. And so the poem is kind of meditating on that, reflecting on the history of Plymouth and my growing up in Plymouth and um, thinking about how poetry can play a role in, uh, in, in history and the storytelling and the stories that keep us together and create our identity. This is Plymouth Cordage. Help weave this heart rope, this cordage of wordage, woven memories, imagination, image and nation, individuals' dreams, 400 years, 12,614,400,000 seconds. We weave the cordage of wordage, a rope across horizon gathering. Every moment we find and write and tell the stories, we take the rope in dinghies and set off toward Europe. Others stay in Plymouth, weaving the rope we carry back eastward around the world. The words, the wars, the bombs, the tragedies and joys, the people, the love, the syllables make lifelines that keep us from drifting into the empty whirlpool of what's forgotten. A story, shivering pilgrims, all aboard over a month, 13 years from home, one birth, one death at sea, desperation their daily ration, water, 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 waves, then 
Cape Cod cupped hand, a continent still big enough for everyone. For now, an etching in black and white, ink and paper, the contrast colors of their pauper clothes. When white men first came ashore and Wampanoag braves watched from shadowy pine patches, there was a mirror between them. Each saw the limits of their imagination reflected in the other. Protestants and the people of dawn, a mirror between them, no attack could shatter, only understanding to clarify. For 400 years we must still try to clarify. We must find and learn and tell the stories. A story, we stand knee deep on Brown's bank and stare into the gaping jaws of autumn. That summer fog swallowed the fireworks. That winter they dredged and dredged the harbor depths. We sledded Burial Hill. That spring was Ziggy's strawberry dipped, stories woven into history. Here, Paul Tosi started picking empty nips off roadsides and parking lots and uncapped a positive movement that makes a difference. We shape and are shaped by our location. Plymouth, pliant mouth, always telling stories. The lips of language kiss the limits of recollection. Pumpkin comes from Papakan, meaning grows forth round. Wampanoag words. Massachusetts, place of the foothill. Plymouth, from Plymouth, England, meaning mouth of the river Plym. A story. I was born on a coast's crooked shoulder, where God's white waves sling shore and sand dunes frame dreams. Where fishermen with missing thumbs used to huddle in fragrant fog from coffee mugs and briar pipes. Night floats the diving bell moon above a wooden flower docked in the harbor. Just now I am lying down to find sleep, reading the braille of stars over Plymouth. Who doesn't want the night sometimes to last forever, so dawn's thumb never swipes sky's screen? Who doesn't want to become the place where they are from? And so these words are stories, strands. In the cordage we are weaving, we learn everything we can and share it. We are gathering and carrying this rope around the world. We set out back eastwards from Plymouth, MA to UK, zigzag across all continents, collecting stories and sending them back to be woven, to keep us together and everyone helps us as we carry the rope over the Golden Gate, under the Rockies, eastward across Ohio, and here we are at exit six, coming back into town to tie the knot where everything started, where this community is still telling its story. So, where should we tie the knot? Where is the heart of your Plymouth? The next poem I'd like to share with you is from my book, Light Reading, uh, my most recent collection of poetry. And this is a poem that is inspired by the music of Philip Glass, a wonderful composer who I uh, wholeheartedly recommend if you don't know his work. And he plays often on the piano and uh, on pipe organ. And this poem is uh, inspired by his music. And also uh, there's a scene here from my childhood as an altar boy at Plymouth, uh, Plymouth's, the, the parish in downtown Plymouth, St. Peter's Parish. And this is entitled Bagatelle for Philip Glass and Pipe Organ in Lieu of Prayer. This is from a section of the book Light Reading um, called Bagatelles for Typewriter. And a bagatelle is a word, a French word that means a trifle or something that's tossed off. It's usually used 
in connection with classical music to mean a, a kind of tossed off, more lighthearted composition. And all of the poems in this section of the book are called bagatelles, and um, they're all kind of playful, and they're, many of them are inspired one way or another by music. <clears throat> and this is Bagatelle for Philip Glass and Pipe Organ in Lieu of Prayer. Thoughtless on a sunny day, empowered by the radiance, let us pray. Forgive the merciless indifference we pay, tabernacled and tackle box. How easy tiny joys elude us. Joy eludes us, yet we, preening, pride in the annihilated need to kneel before anything, unless observing ceremonies necessary to get ahead to heaven or the boardroom. As an altar boy, I loved velvet silences of sacristies, brass taper holders, bell-shaped snuff that flamed a hand to reach me as I, mischievous, melted old wax with a wooden match, hollered in my head the devil I felt had found me a moment before returning to the grim serenity of God. The last poem that I'd like to share with you um, is a new poem, and um, it's an elegy. It's also a kind of an elegy, and um, it's an elegy for my father, and uh, who it's an elegy for my father, and it's set in Plymouth. And um, if you've been down to Plymouth recently, you've noticed that they've been uh, dredging the harbor. And um, this poem references that and uses it as, uh, as a metaphor. And it's called Red Sky at Morning. You might know the, um, the sailor's adage, red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky at morning, sailors take warning. And um, so this is uh, Red Sky at Morning. It's from my father. Uh, who is still with us, thankfully, although this poem is elegiac in spirit. And he was a, a, a sailor, a chief engineer on an oil tanker. And um, that's why this poem is based in marine imagery. Red sky at morning. Barges dredge Plymouth Harbor. Gape of my father's mouth half-conscious, neurological, I see you, I lean into his crusted lips to catch a few knotted words in the bucket of my ear. Crane jaws gorge on dripping blobs of silt and seawater, mud and stone, torn from the bottom they must deepen. We are swimming over a pit's edge, empty grave holes underwater, Cemetery of the sea, dark splotches on his brain scan, blood bursts the hulls of its vessels. My father floats inside his diving bell, body depressurized eyes, distant radar pulses fading down a sunken canyon. Now, a poet that I love and admire, the German language poet Rainer Maria Rilke, said that um, great poems begin in elegy and end in praise. And I've read a couple of elegies here, and I'd like to end in praise and, and end on a, a warmer note, uh, a brighter note for these times. And this poem is the opening poem from my collection, Light Reading, and it's called Abed. And, and Abed is typically a poem from dawn that is spoken um, by a lover in bed with uh, his or her lover at dawn and not wanting to leave the bed. And this is a very short one-line poem, and it's uh, entitled Abed. What you cried when you came from the womb is your name. And in this poem, I'm trying to get at the wonder of birth and the wonder of life and the wonder of language and the gift of language. And I revel in that gift. 
and I hope you have too in these last few minutes, and I hope you've enjoyed these poems. Thank you very much, and be well.